to all of you and welcome to another edition of Bible study here at the Great Rock Hill Baptist Church. Uh, this evening, our studies will be taken from the Life Application Study Bible. It's the Life Application Study Bible. We're in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 13. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, beginning at verse 13. Before we get started, I'd like to ask uh, a few questions, see if some folks are paying attention, see if we all um, got this thing. First, I'd like to ask, uh, who is the writer? Who is doing the writing um, of the book of First and Second Corinthians? Who's the writer? Paul. Oh. Oh. The Apostle Paul. The right. Apostle Paul is the writer. And who is the Apostle writing directly to? To the Church of Corinth. To the Church of Corinth. What is the relation of the Apostle Paul to the Church at Corinth? What is his, who is Paul to the Church at Corinth? One of the churches he started. Say again. One of the churches he started. Amen. He is okay. the founder. He started the church at Corinth. He's the founder. Um, what? There were various reasons for him writing um, this letter back to the church. Somebody tell me one of the reasons why Paul is writing this letter, this epistle. Tell me one of the reasons. Because the people were starting to backslide or they were bickering with each other in the church yeah. and he's trying to straighten them out. Amen. Amen. He had received. I'm sorry about that. Say again. Yeah, he had received word that the church was going astray. The church mm -hmm. was basically leaving uh, uh, its, its roots. It was um, uh, false. Teachers had infiltrated the church and folks were starting to uh, go contrary to what was taught there at the church. Amen. So in chapter 15, uh, what is Paul driving home in this chapter? What has been the basis or um, um, the foundation of this entire chapter thus far? What have we been studying the last two weeks? Resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I find it amazing how extensive, how deep he goes in this entire chapter. Chapter 15 is a very long chapter. And I find it amazing how he keeps driving this point home about the resurrection, about the resurrection. And what we ought to get from this is the importance of the resurrection. We are supposed to learn from this that the resurrection is our roots, our, our foundation. It is what um, Christianity is built on, based on what we believe. If we are not clear in standing on the resurrection, then you are not clear um, with Christianity. Christianity, the basis of what we believe is that Jesus resurrected, he was raised from the dead, and because of his resurrection, we now have a right to the tree of blood. Mm -hmm. Basically, that is all that Christianity is, and if we don't have that, if we allow anything to infiltrate our beliefs and change us from believing in that, we have an issue. We have a problem. So, mm -hmm. The great apostle Paul is writing to the church. Brother Gene, if you may, my brother, on page 222, if you please read the brief introduction before verse number 13. The church at Corinth was in the heart of Greek culture. Thus, many believers had a difficult time believing in a bodily resurrection. Paul wrote this part of his letter to clear up this confusion about the resurrection. Notice the, 13. Commentator, notice the commentator 
wants us to realize that the church at Corinth was right in the midst of Greek culture. Okay, so nothing's new about the church uh, being uh, in the world, uh, but the church must not be of the world. So the commentator here wants us to realize that the church itself, the building, the building, he's talking about the building of the church. It was in the middle of Greek culture. And a lot of time, the world, uh, uh, if we're not careful as believers, we will allow the world to shape and mold the church. Whereas the church ought to be shaping and molding the world. Yes, we are in this world, but the church, and when I'm talking about the church, now I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the people, the members. We ought to not allow the culture that's around us to shape and mold our thinking, our beliefs, how we respond to things, how we act. We ought to be shaping and molding the world or the culture that's around us. So I like the way the commentator wanted us to realize that the church was in the middle of Greek culture. And uh, oftentimes, if the church is doing um, what it's supposed to do, if the church is in line with what Christ has called the church to be in line, um, Sister Lynn, I've got a text from someone saying that they are in a waiting room. Apparently, they cannot get in. <laughs> Sister Asia Patton just sent me a text saying she's in the waiting room. But she cannot get on. But um, if the church is doing what Christ has called the church to do, often, and I mean very often, we will be clashing. I think I see a Sister Patton connecting. Amen. To God be the glory. Um, we should clash with the culture that's around us often when we're doing or staying in right relation with the Lord. Come on, Brother Gene, and read for me, please. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Paul argued that if the resurrection is not possible, then Jesus is still in the grave. If Jesus is still in the grave, then the apostles' preaching is useless because they preached a risen Savior. If Christ has not been raised, believers' faith is also useless. Why believe in the dead Savior? If Jesus is still dead, then his sacrifice did not appease God for believers' sin. And believers have no advocate with the Father. They also have no comfort in the Holy Spirit. For he was to come when Christ returned to glory. They have no hope of eternal life, not even if their Savior gained eternal life. They have no reason to believe a gospel message centered on resurrection if there is no resurrection of the dead. Amen. A mouthful there. Let's dive right on in. Let's get right on in. Hello, Sister Patton. Happy to have you with us. Glad that you were able to connect. Um, let's so let's get right on in to this. Uh, Paul says, if Jesus is still well, the commentator writes in reference to the verses read, if Jesus is still in the grave, then the apostles' preaching is useless because they preach a risen savior. Mm -hmm. So if, if 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 Christ is not risen, this is amazing how the church allowed false teachers to infiltrate them and to cause them to waver in their belief so much so that Paul had to reteach and re-preach the resurrection. So Paul says, well, if Jesus has not been resurrected, if Jesus is still in the grave, then Paul says, then the preaching is in vain. Preachers, I see Reverend 
Perkins here. I'm sure Evangelist Brown is here. I'm sure um, Minister Warren is here. I'm sure I don't see their names, but I'm sure they are here. Uh, if your message is not centered around the resurrection, <laughs> your preaching is in vain. If you're not preaching Christ, Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ now sitting on the right hand of the book, your preaching is in vain. It is a crying shame that the church at Corinth had allowed false teachers to infiltrate them so much so that Paul had to reteach, re-preach, re-emphasize the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If Christ has not been risen, believers' faith is also useless. Your faith is useless if Christ hasn't risen. Now, the, the commentator writes that if Christ has not been risen, then his sacrifice had not been recognized by God. Now, somebody help me. I want to, you, you Bible scholars, let's talk. What is the commentator referring to when he talks about in Christ's sacrifice would not be of any gain? Or, or it would be used. What is this sacrifice that he's talking about? Somebody help me. His death on the cross. Okay. His yeah, death yeah. on the cross. Okay. You're right. I want somebody to take me though. Let's go back to the sacrifice. Let's, let's dig into it. Let's get deep. Let's go back to Old Testament. And somebody help me. Bring me up to Jesus's sacrifice, uh, 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 Jesus' sacrifice um, being uh, um, uh, being ordained to being worthy of the remission of sins. Let's start from Old Testament. Somebody bring me up to Jesus's death being a sacrifice for the, for the remission of sin. So I know um, in the Old Testament, good afternoon, everybody, in the Old Testament um, and during this time, what the people would do is for remission of their sin is that they would do a, a calf sacrifice. It was about the shedding of blood, right? And so they would, they, would do, they would do a calf sacrifice. There was a shedding of blood to atone for whatever sins that was going on. So as the people became more sinful, more things were happening, um, I guess in, in the way that I can explain it is there needed to be an atonement. There needed to be shedding of blood, but it needed to be from something so much more pure because we had all begun so corrupt. So in the Old Testament, it, it states, you know, the Savior will come, the Savior will come. So Jesus Christ is that Savior without that spot or wrinkle that the world needed in order for that blood to be shed to atone us for all the sins. We had just gotten so corrupt. So it was like the Cadillac of, of, of atonement at that time. You know, we needed to have someone <laughs> prominent, something extremely Christ-like in order to atone for our sins. Preach, preacher. Preach. <laughs> now, let me help you with that explanation. Great, you did a great job. But let me say this, and this is very important. We gotta understand this. Listen, this, okay. So in the Old Testament, it is said, it strips you. The only way for sin to be atoned, or sin to be forgiven, that's what atonement is, is through the shedding of blood. Listen to this, this is deep. The shedding of animal blood was never sufficient for the atonement of sin. Mm -hmm. The shedding of animal blood was something that God accepted for a time. Mm -hmm. So the shedding of animal blood was a foreshadowing of the perfect sacrifice that was to come in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Paul says, well, if there is Therefore, now, no resurrection from the dead. And if that's what you all are now believing, and Paul says, well, then we as human beings have not received 
a perfect sacrifice for the atoning of sin. So Paul says if the resurrection is not true or if it's not of any value, then guess what? We're still in a sinful state. We, 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 we have not had in the Old Testament any animal sacrifice that you brought to the priest. It was scripture. It was biblical that the animal had to be perfect without blemish. It had to be a perfect. You can bring a blind animal to be sacrificed. Or you can bring a three-legged lamb. You, it had to be a perfect. So Jesus was that perfect sacrifice for the sins of mankind. Thank you so very much. It says here, now this is very important. I This is deep. It says here, they also have no comforter in the Holy Spirit. He was to come when Christ returned to glory. We find that in John 16th chapter, verses 5 and verses 13 through 15. Christ says, when he was leaving, and when his apostles were all broken up, Master, if you leave us, if you die, if you go back to glory, what's going to become of us? He says, I will not leave you comfortless. Huh? Anybody remember that? Yeah. All right. So he says, when I'm gone, I will send you a comforter. That comforter was the Holy Ghost. Now, if there was no resurrection, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then we have no Holy Ghost that will live inside of us to guide us and comfort us because he said that the comforter will not come until his return to the Father. So Paul is just laying it all out. He says, man, if y'all don't believe in the resurrection, if we don't have the resurrection, we have nothing. All right. Any comments? Any questions before we go on? Amen. Brother Gene, we will read the pillar, please. Call for mission. The bodily resurrection of Christ is the center of Christian faith. Because Christ rose from the dead as he promised, we know that what he said is true and that he is God. The resurrection affirms the truthfulness of Jesus' life and words. The resurrection confirms that Jesus' unique authority to say, I am the resurrection and the life. Because he rose, we have certainty that our sins are forgiven. Because he rose and he lives and represents us before God. Because he rose and defeated death, we know we will also be raised. Christ's resurrection guarantees both his promise to us and his authority to make it. We must take him at his word and believe. Amen. The resurrection affirms the truthfulness of Christ's life and words. The resurrection affirms it. If you could remember, Jesus was trying to prepare his apostles for his departure from the very beginning of his ministry. He was trying to prepare them. And he told them that just as just as I'm trying to remember the prophet Jonah. <laughs> just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale. Well, I'm sorry. In the belly of the fish. Let me make it clear. Yep. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days, and he will arise. He said that. So the resurrection affirms Jesus' words. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Come on, Brother Gene. Let's read. More than that, when we are found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him. In fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. Mm -hmm. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, not only would the apostles' preaching be useless, but the apostles themselves would be considered liars, false witnesses about God. Because they had been preaching about God, that he raised Christ from the dead, the apostles had been telling people that God raised Christ from the dead. However, if the resurrection is impossible, if the dead are not raised, then Christ was not raised. 
This point is repeated from 15 and 13 to drive home the point. The Corinthians had to understand that the logical implications of the position they had chosen. To no longer believe in the physical resurrection was to throw away the entire gospel message. They could not claim to be Christians without believing in the resurrection. To no longer believe in the physical resurrection was to throw away the entire gospel message. If we can't agree on that, if we can't get that together, if we can't see eye to eye on that, we, we, we got a problem. Christianity is founded. That is the foundation. That is the basis. That's what we believe. That's what keeps us. That's what guides us. Uh, the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For oh, glory. Read on, Brother Gene. Verse 17. And if Christ had not, and if Christ had not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are guilty of your sins. Again, Paul proclaimed that if Christ had not been raised, then your faith is useless. They have no reason to have faith, and if they take the resurrection out of the faith, in addition to taking away the, the hope of the future life of God, refusing to believe that Jesus rose from the grave means that Christians are still guilty of their sins. If Jesus died and was never raised, then his death did nothing to accomplish justification. God raising him from the dead showed acceptance of Christ's sacrifice. If God left Jesus in the grave, then the sacrifice was not accepted, and no one has received cleansing from sin. The condemnation for sin is death. To still be under condemnation means that all people will be given the ultimate penalty for their sins. Amen. Okay. Refusing to believe that Jesus rose from the grave means that Christians are still guilty of their sins. Lord, have mercy. Let me ask someone. Someone explain to me, biblically now, biblically, what is justification? Not just the definition of the word. Tell me, biblically, what does it mean to be justified or what is justification biblically don't everybody speak at the same time i would say it's believing in the word and believing that christ died for our sin okay uh, i'm gonna have to go no justification biblically 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 no human sacrifice could suffice for what Jesus did for, uh, for us. His sacrifice made it perfect, uh, the perfect sacrifice for us to be accepted back to God. Okay, all right. All right, Deke, you explained that correctly. You know that's not how I want to say it, but you explained it correctly. <laughs> that's, that, that's correct. Okay. Deke, you did a great job on that. Okay, listen. Justify, biblically. When you see that word in the text, justified, biblically, means although you're guilty, God is dismissing your charges. If you're in court, if, if you're in court, and, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you are found guilty, Let's say you were found guilty. Sister Young, you help me with this now, Verdell. This was your specialty. But let's just say you had a great lawyer. Although all the evidence had already mounted up on you, but you had a great lawyer. And yeah, you guilty. And I mean, and the prosecution is proving its case. And just before the judge was about to rule, and he gives both sides closing arguments. And then your lawyer, with his slick self or her slick self, stands up and finds a loophole or something that wasn't done exactly correct during your arrest or something. And because of the loophole, the judge says, uh, this case says, the evidence says you're guilty. I mean, you're guilty. 
-hmm. But because of you having such a good lawyer, it is God. The new world, mm -hmm. I must drop all charges. Mm -hmm. That's justification in scripture. When you see the word being justified, mm -hmm. it means all the evidence says we're guilty of sin. We are we are wrecked undone. But all we have of the Lord, mm -hmm. his name is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And although justice says that we deserve this, mm -hmm. our lawyer stands up and says, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. My blood was shed for that one. And if you're covered by the blood, although you're guilty, the verdict comes in and says, all charges has been dropped. Yeah. Anybody happy? for justification this morning. Yes, we yes. are. Everybody Ooh. is. <laughs> yes. I, huh? I know uh -huh. I'm guilty, mm -hmm. but I got a good lawyer. His name is Jesus. Yes. The Bible, this commentator talked about us all receiving the ultimate penalty for our sins. Somebody tell me, what is the ultimate penalty for sin? Yeah. Death, 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 death. No, y'all got to come a little bit harder than the, that. The ultimate penalty, the ultimate penalty is, is, the ultimate is burning in hell. That's the ultimate penalty. Thank yeah. you, Sister yeah. Patton. Thank okay. you, Brother Davis. All right. The ultimate penalty. See, you got to understand death. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, all right. Now, so since y'all brought up death, I was going to go there a little bit later in the study. But let's just, okay, so the ultimate penalty is an eternal burning hell. That's uh -huh. the ultimate penalty. Now, somebody explained to me, there's a bird chirping. Okay. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody explained to me. Birds, birds, don't, birds don't chirp at night. <laughs> they chirp during the day. But anyway, sorry. Anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, I'm awake now. But anyway, somebody explained to me the biblical. Now let's get deep on this. Somebody tell me the biblical definition of death. And no, the biblical definition of death is not in your lungs. Seeds to inhale and exhale. <laughs> so, 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 so let me stop you right now. That's the physical definition of death. Somebody mm -hmm. tells me when, 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 when God told Adam and Eve the day that you eat from the tree, you will surely die. Right. They ate from the tree, but their lungs did not stop inhaling and exhaling, but they mm -hmm. were already dead. dead. Mm -hmm. So somebody explained to me what is death in the biblical sense. What's that? Ultimate <laughs> separation from God. Not Thank believing. You, Not yeah. believing. See, now see, that's how I wanted okay. to hear it ex explained. Yeah, thank you, Deacon yeah. Perkins. Okay. Death, the biblical definition of death is separation from God. Now, although Adam and Eve were still inhaling and exhaling, the day that they committed that sin, they were separated from God. Mm -hmm. that's what an eternal penalty is of sin you trust me your spirit man is going to be alive your spirit man will be alive but you will be separated from God uh -huh. that's biblical death biblical death your spirit man is still living. You want to think about that. You don't want to experience that. Lord, have mercy. Any comments? Any questions? So I, I have a comment or a question for the group. Um, I would say... You know, listening to what you're saying and having that physical, I mean, I'm sorry, that spiritual separation, right? Yeah. Um, so many of us, I say us, right? Many of us are just going through life 
dead then. We, and maybe some of us don't even know, right? Because I know that there's been times in my life where I felt so close to God. I'm like, whoa, he, whoa, he actually do talk. Cause I hear people say this, oh, the Lord talked to me and told me and I would go, but well, he don't ever talk to me. I don't hear nothing. There ain't no <laughs> building up. There ain't no burning bush, right? And then there are other times when I feel like, man, he is so silent. Mm -hmm. in life. And then it makes me think to myself, like, okay, what did I do? Am I not praying enough? Am I not quiet? Like, am I not hearing him? Like, I just feel so far. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I wonder then, well, I'm going to say, I feel like this is why they say, you know, prayer without ceasing or to live a repentant life or whatever. Like, I don't want anything to separate that. Because in those times when I do feel like he's far away, because I know what it's like when I feel near to him, it is very scary. Mm. You know, it's very scary. So, but it just makes me think like listening to you tonight, Rev, is like, man, there's probably so many people around us in our everyday life that they don't even know mm -hmm. the goodness or they don't even realize that. That they are spiritually dead. Spiritually dead. Right. Yeah. Spiritually dead. Right. Physically right. they may right. be living. But let me help you with something. Let me help you with something that I had to digest. When we talk about, about, about the silence of God or, 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 or when we talk about not hearing a God speak audibly, okay? Let me ask you something. How, how, how often do, are you spirit led? How often do you uh, plan to do something and then something inside of you say, no, you shouldn't do that? Or how often do you plan to go somewhere and something inside of you said, no, don't go there? Uh, now here's my thing. Here's 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 where I am. Let me let me let me tell you about mine because I'm so sharp tongued. So you know me. I'm, you know the Lord got to work with me there. Very right. Stuff in your head, baby. Stuff Amen. Like <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes, when I'm just about to say something that 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 that, that is not becoming of Pastor Young, but I hear something says. I don't think you want to say that. Mm -hmm. So how often do you now that happens all the time? Right. Am I correct? If yes. you got the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes. so so let's be careful. See, I had to learn this. Let's be careful when we say, Oh, I don't hear from God, or or, or God has been silent. That's not true. That's not true. You're right. You, you're right. It's not true. But we, so many people that, uh, so many people confuse, well, I'm not say confused, but so many people call that their conscience. That's, that's yes. actually, like you said, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. But we, Amen. we conflict with it and say, oh, that's my conscience. No, no, it's not your conscience. That's the, the, the fight of good and evil between you telling you what not to do with your crazy self. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what it well, is. That, well, well, you know what? Here's another saying that that we like to say. We always say this, and, and you hear it all the time. Or oh, the devil, he never takes a break. Or oh, the devil, he never knocks off. Well, that's true. But here's a revelation for you: Holy Ghost don't ever clock out either. I like that. I like that. He never clocks out. Mm -hmm. So, 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 I mean, when you're hearing from that no good rascal, <laughs> well, you ain't fooling me. If you're holding on, Phil, well, you hear from the spirit too. Uh, uh, now, I don't know if y'all are as crazy as I am. And um, let me just be honest. I like to be honest with mine. There's been a time or two, I've heard the spirit and spoke back to the spirit and told the spirit, well, spirit, I'm going to be me today. <laughs> I've done that with my crazy self. Yeah. Uh, guess yeah. what? Yeah. You've done it. Now, yes. you yeah. might not have spoken audibly mm -hmm. like I did, but guess how you spoke? Mm -hmm. In your action. action. Even, action. Though, action. even yeah. though you heard you still did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. But um, 
Every yeah. now and then, me and my old sharp tongue, sometimes when I want to say what I just want to say, I hear the Spirit say, don't say that. And I'll be like, my Holy Ghost not today now. <laughs> just, yeah. just, just, just this time, I'm going to go ahead and just be burning. Since I can't be past the young, I'm gonna yeah. just be burning. <laughs> but he never knocks on. And yes, that's not just your conscience. So, Sister Patton, the next time, the next time that the enemy wants to convince you that you ain't hearing from God, don't buy that, sis. That's just the enemy that wants you to think a particular way. Mm. Hear from him all the time. Right, right. Holy Spirit don't knock on. All right. Huh? And you'll hear from him when you don't want to, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, Lord, yes, he'll correct yes. you in a minute. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Verse number 18, Brother Gene, 18 through verse number 19, please. All uh, right, you do realize you're skipping the pillar, right? Oh, no, no, no. I don't want to skip the hard truth. No. So let's read the hard truth at the pillar. Why does Paul say believers should be pitied if they if their only earthly values to Christianity? In Paul's day, Christianity often brought a person's persecution, ostracism from family, and in many cases, poverty. There were few tangible benefits from being a Christian in that society. It was certainly not a step up the social or career ladder. Even more important, however, is the fact that if Christ had not been resurrected from death, Christians could not be forgiven for their sins and would have no hope of eternal life. In many places in the world today, those who believe in Christ still pay a heavy price. Some are dying for their faith. But for many, Christianity is a little more than a convenient faith. If following Christ doesn't place you at odds with the world around you in some way, you need to examine the depth of your roots. Mm. Oh, it's preaching time now. Mm. <laughs> Y'all don't mind. Here is where I take off. Mm. Uh, look at that very last sentence of this, <laughs> the pillow. It says, and I want you to hear this now. I'm not going to read it as well as Brother Gene. Doesn't he read with conviction? Mm -hmm. but it says, if following Christ doesn't place you at odds with the world around you in some way, examine the depth of your roots. Mm. Now, 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 you got to come on with this now. Uh, now, we can stay right here for the rest of the Bible study. If following Christ does not put you at odds, with the world around you, you don't have enough Jesus. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If following Christ hasn't made a few folk, now I'm telling you now, every real Christian ought to have about 10 folks that can't stand you mm. for the sake of the gospel. Mm. If you ain't, if, 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 if you don't know some folks that just don't like your guts, can't stand you, and you can say to yourself, I know I haven't done anything to that person. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you ain't doing this thing right. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you, I, I got some folks can't stand Pastor Young. <laughs> they don't like the even presence of Pastor Young. Mm. And guess what? Pastor Young knows I've never done anything to them for them to be there. But I'm so glad. Mm, go ahead now, Pastor. Oh, watch out, girl. Watch <laughs> Hell out, nah. girl. Go ahead now. <laughs> but I'm so glad. I'm about to shout in my kitchen. Go ahead. That I have a testimony. <laughs> yes, sir. That I can say. Yes. Blessed is the man All right. who suffers for righteousness sake. Mm, mm, Boy, if you ain't got that testimony, mm, you ain't got enough Jesus. Mm, um, 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 uh, another thing about Pastor Young, you find this about him if, if you don't know him, just observe him. Pastor Young will put more stock in being right with Jesus 
Mm, yes, sir. And not being in good relationship with you. Amen. Any day of the week. All if right. I gotta choose with being in right relationship with Christ and you being upset with me, honey, you gonna be upset. Go with ahead. Him. That's right. right. That's right. All I got for you is what thus Amen. says the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Somebody just text, I'll choose Jesus every time. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, 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 so listen, your faith is supposed to bring you at odds with the world every now and then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know- but you know, but you know what the problem is in a lot of churches? The reason why churches are slowly moving away from what God has called us to. You know why? Because in these churches, we too busy trying to be friends with all the members. Mm -hmm. We too busy wanting everybody to like us. Mm -hmm. We too busy wanting to get on the bandwagon with Uncle Johnny. Do you know Uncle Johnny wrong? As a matter of fact, you ain't never seen Uncle Johnny on the right side of an issue since you known Uncle Johnny. (laughs) <laughs> but see, Uncle Johnny, your blood. <laughs> oh, 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 I got to stand with Uncle Johnny. You ought to look Uncle Johnny in the eye and say, Uncle Johnny, I can't, I can't support you in that. That's not Christ-like. Amen. Not. So, Pastor yeah. Young, let me ask you a question, too. Like, um, So, I, I would say, I totally understand where this verse is coming from, right? Let's say... The geisha pattern from two years ago versus the geisha pattern now. There were some things that I was okay with doing and saying and being places two years ago that today I don't feel it, right? You know, like, it's like, I'll tell you how I really noticed this for me. Years ago, um, when I was growing up, there was this movie out. It's called Harlem Nights. I'm sure all of y'all have heard of that movie before. Oh, yeah. Love that movie growing up. (laughs) But over the years... You learn more things, you grow, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say roughly seven to eight years ago, the movie was on TV and I couldn't, I couldn't even watch it. You know what I mean? It was just too much curse. It was just too much of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Before, Mm -hmm. for me, that was a classic. I love it. Mm -hmm. But now the person that I am today, because I've grown, right, can't do it. And mm. the same with some childhood friends. I realized that, whoa, you know, we kind of sort of outgrew each other. No love loss, but those things I used to do with you, I don't want to do. And it, uh-huh. yeah. But but I want to pose this question to the team. I want to hear what everyone else got to say. Do you all feel, and I want to go back to what you talked about, Reverend Young, about churches not progressing because they want to be friends, right? I want to ask you all, because this is what I found. How do you all feel about this? Maybe churches continue in that way because for them, it's tradition. And the reason I say that too, I just want to give, I want to give justification for why I feel that way. I grew up learning certain things, but as I became a scholar, I realized that some of the things that I was taught in my own home church those were traditions. They weren't Bible-based. You, you know what I mean? Yes, amen. So I would ask everyone. And so, and then, and then even with that, like, it makes me think like, oh, wait a minute. You can't go to no altar without a doily on your head. You got to have a doily mm-hmm. on your head. You know, just That's different things, true. different things. Mm-hmm. Um, but how do you all feel about that to say some people just, some churches or some people remain in this place because for them it's safe and it's traditional and it doesn't matter i found no matter how much you try to explain and clear things up and say hey have you thought about it like this because i think the way that we've always learned it is probably not bible versus ame baptist Mm -hmm. catholic but you you know what i mean how do you all feel about that Can I say? Go ahead. Because I didn't want us all to speak at one time. (laughs) Well, I do like some of the traditional stuff because some of the traditional stuff keeps us grounded and rooted, okay? But 
the thing that I have a problem with is when you have pastors who don't even know that what they're teaching is wrong. So my thing is, how do we correct the pastors? Because we, we, we we're following what, what we're being taught. So if, and, and some of the traditions I think need to be remained because some of those traditions is what kept us grounded and rooted in our churches. Okay. I, I agree. I totally agree with what um, uh, Dale said. However, there are some things traditionally that we take to the extreme that once, like Geisha said, once you get to a certain place in your walk with Christ, you look at it and it doesn't make sense. Not just that it, it doesn't make sense, but it's not scripture. I posed a question because I had a discussion with a friend about you being married, your spouse dying, how long do you, I mean, you can go, the, the, your vows say you till death do you part. So if you go and you decide two weeks later, you want to be married to somebody else, and the scripture, that's okay. But we are so in tradition where people are saying, oh no, you have to mourn for a year. You have to wait black for a year. You can't, <laughs> that's not scripture. Mm -hmm. So I, I made the statement in my, um, in, in my Facebook post, my pastor says it's not scripture. Go ahead, preach I said it's it's not scripture, so I ain't going by what you say. So if you drop dead tomorrow, right now, twenty minutes later, if I want to date somebody else, scripturally, I can't. You're released. I'm released from my vows. So I totally understand what Dale said, and I understand exactly what Gisha says. There are some traditions we need to keep because people will take things and just go run too far. But there are some that we need to really get rid of and stop doing. Well, I'm going. I to think I think tradition. Okay, I think your this tradition need to be. If your tradition ain't biblically based, you need to trash that, regardless of what it is. Tradition, <laughs> okay. if it's not biblically Amen. based, trash it. Amen. And that's why if you, if that's why you come to. That's why we here because you come to Bible study to learn what thus says the Lord. That way you can decipher that garbage from what's real. And that, that, that tradition is trash. If it ain't going to be made, throw it away. Okay. May I say something? May I say yes. something? Yes. Go ahead, Mother. The Holy Spirit is what runs the church. There's not supposed to be no tradition in God's house. Amen. It is Absolutely. the church is run strictly by the Holy Spirit. Scripture. Amen. Scripture. Scripture. Amen. Right. Okay, so and that's that's true. It just in a lot of churches, it it doesn't happen. It's it's I mean, you can see that. And I'm not, you know, not to bash any church. That's not what this is. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. as we learn, you mm -hmm. know, some churches make up their own doctrine, you know, and mm -hmm. some of those things are not about the management of the church. Some of them are even going to beliefs. So that's why I'm I'm asking, you know, just just for conversation, you know, it's just it's a really good topic to really to dive into, you know, going back to the strip to the scripture. It's just, you know, I just wanted to know how how you all felt about that. So Amen. I mean, yeah, the Holy Spirit and the Word of God should be what's right, but mm -hmm. you know, just like Sister Young said, if pastors are not taking it upon themselves to educate themselves, then I'm gonna just like how I grew up learning things that I thought were scripture. Um, and this, and it wasn't scripture. It was just what we did at St. James AME church. You know, it's just, it's just what we did. not bad, but I thought those things were right. I see you trying to get in mama. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we can't hear you. You got to unmute your mic. Unmute your mic. <laughs> unmute Verdell. Verdell, you need to unmute. Now you're muted. Unmute again. <laughs> okay, we still can't hear you, although you're unmuted. We can't hear you. Well, I'm going to enter. Okay, I think we heard you. Try again. I was saying whoever the host is could unmute her. <laughs> oh, she's unmuted now. We still can't hear. Okay, all right. So let me dive in here because 
time is really moving right along. This is a very good discussion. Okay. Mr. Bradell Young says some of the traditions she would like for us to keep because those, those traditions kept us. And I'm going to agree with Brother Gene Chavis and Sister Alma Burton. Uh, any tradition, I don't care what it is, if it's in your church, if it's not biblical, it need, you need to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I don't Amen. care what it is. Amen. Any Amen. tradition, if it's not, if you can't prove it biblically, it has no place in the house of God. Somebody Amen. just sent the text. Somebody just sent the text and asked, doesn't it start with the leadership? Let me dive into that because it was said that there are times that the pastors don't know any better and they are screwing out uh, information that is not biblical. It begins with the leadership, I believe. It begins with the leadership. Now, the leader has to be rooted, grounded in Christ, knowing what's biblical and what's not. Amen. But now, here's the thing. Upon the leader teaching, guiding and directing, the flock must be receptive of what's being taught and what is scripture. Now, if the flock, upon hearing, now, y'all have done this because I've done it. Now, I wasn't always in the pulpit now. I, I, I was in the pews longer than I was in the pulpit. There been times I sat in the pews and heard a word come from the pulpit, and I'll say in the pews, hmm, <laughs> he ain't talking to me. <laughs> and normally when I said that, he was coming right down my street and needed to address my life. So if you're in the pews and you hear the word, you get upset and say, well, okay, I'm not going there. But then you're going to hold on to that. But listen, here's another thing. And here's what I try to stress. We all should be spending some time with the Lord throughout the week. Really? Really, really? You, 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 those, the members of Rock Hill Baptist, you have this book. You have it. And you know what we're going to cover the next week because we're going to pick up right from where we left. How dare you come to Bible study and you haven't picked up the book all week to study so that God can talk to you? Now, let's just suppose, what are you going to do if Pastor Young is an idiot? Pastor Young might be a spiritual idiot. And if you come here and let me teach you but you haven't spoken to God before you came here. Amen. That's what you got to do. You mm -hmm. have to now accept whatever I say as gospel. Mm -hmm. Had you picked up the book before you came here tonight, God would have already spoken to you. And if I wasn't teaching correctly, you would have already been known. You would have raised your hand and said, wait a minute, pastor. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I don't mm -hmm. believe that's what that says. But if you don't apply yourself, guess what you got to do? You got to take it from me. So, yes, a lot of that that you just brought up, a lot of that, let me, I'm going to say this, and then we have to close because I don't like to go over the time. But I am going to say this, and I know we have at least two persons on, on here, no, three, that are, that are not Baptists. Okay? So let me say this and being a little bit biased. Uh, this is what I like about the Baptist faith. In the Baptist church, every church is individually governed. Every church is individually governed. So here at Rock Hill Baptist Church, I don't have to answer to no outside entities. No, no outside entities can govern or rule anything here at Rock Hill Baptist. So here at Rock Hill Baptist Church, if we're not being led by scripture, it's all Pastor Young's fault because we have no outside entities. Now, there are a few organizations like the one that I came from. I was AME. Okay. The pastor does not have free reign to teach, preach gospel because he or she must answer to the presiding elder. 
Then the presiding elder have to answer to bishop. the bishop. Well, sometimes those pastors really want to do what thus says the Lord, <laughs> but their hands are tied and they can't. So I knew, and this is just for me, I knew I couldn't pastor in the Amy dirt because I've never been a yes man. And I'm not going to go along with wrong because my supervisor says X, Y, Z. I like it in the Baptist church because as a pastor, Jesus is my supervisor. Mm. The moderator don't run nothing around here. Mm. Huh? Amen. Anything that goes on at Rock Hill Baptist Church, it's because we as a congregation allows it. Mm -hmm. So I love the Baptist faith in that we are individually governed and here oh, at Rock Hill Baptist Church, now I don't know about no other Baptist church, and only speak for the one that I passed. I lead according to what thus says the Lord. I tell the people at Rock Hill, I tell the people at Rock Hill, when you all get tired of Pastor Young leading, according to the scripture, y'all have your meeting and run him off. Because as long as I'm pastoring, what's going to go in here is what thus says the Lord. Then I challenge them. Then I turn around and challenge them. When y'all see me going contrary to what thus says the Lord, that's when y'all are not supposed to sit quiet in the pews. Y'all are supposed to raise your hands and say, wait a minute, pastor. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Rev. No disrespect. But Rev, that ain't biblical. All right. Amen. And don't let me bring it in here if it ain't biblical. You have a mandate. We ought to watch out for each other. Amen. That being said, we have to stop. Amen. I pastor a group of people that care and love each other so much that we come together and we show that love. Rock Hill, I want to thank you all for being the congregation that you all are. And I'm telling you all, I brag about you all, all the time. And these pastors with these mega churches and these big old church, I'm telling you, they ain't got nothing on Pastor Young. I pastor some beautiful people. And Amen. I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be a leader. Evangelist Brown, we will always be with you. And sis, I will always be your pastor. Mm -hmm. Call me if you need me. We're right here for you. We love you. Amen. 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 You don't Amen. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Mary. Thank you. Cry a minute now. Thank you. <laughs> you welcome, my love. Amen. <laughs> yeah, Amen. you'll cry in a minute. <laughs> Shut I, I up there. Else to see that. <laughs> I'll see that. <laughs> well, um, we're going to close out now. Evangelist, I want you to know that you really blessed me today. Rock Hill, you all do it all the time. All the time. Y'all are great people. Great enjoyed people. the Bible study tonight. This is my first time on Zoom. I really, really enjoyed the pastor. Yeah. Amen. 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 Very good. You look, you, look, you look almost good enough to be my wife, girl. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but let us oh. actually, girl, go ahead and text me your number, please. <laughs> <laughs> let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we have spent together. Lord, you've been here because we felt you. Yes, Lord. Lord, I know your presence was in this building. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I believe the listeners, those that were tuned in, I believe they felt your presence as well. Oh, yes. Yes. Father, I pray that your word will now become a light unto our pathway. Please. I pray that your word will govern our steps, govern mm -hmm. our thoughts and our actions. Yes. Father, we are to become doers of the word and not just hearers. Now, Father, as we leave this Bible study, we will never leave your presence. Yes. Ask, Lord. Lord, that you go with us and continue to lead, guide, and protect us. Please. But we pray now for yes. the healing of this life. 
Come on, Father, and do the good that we all stand in need of. Yes. Lord, we pray that the scientists and the doctors did not it correct. We pray that the vaccine, Lord, will bring healing to this land. Yes. But Lord, yes. Lord, until you speak, yes. we pray yes. that you will cover us with your protection. Yes. 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 Kind and tender kid. And then, Father, I ask a special blessing for Rock Hill Baptist Church. I pray, yes. Lord, yes. You encourage us, embolden us, that in doing these troubling times, we will continue to rightfully divide your word, spread this gospel, yes. and church the unchurch. Yes. Oh, yes. Father, yes. we're oh, yes. doing all these things. We'll be careful to give the name the honor, the glory, and the praise for all of these blessings. We ask them in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 On next Wednesday. You'll be blessed. Good night, nice everybody. Good night, everybody. He's real.